on the season premiere of Latinas, we'll talk body positivity for Nuestra Mujeres, learn about CRT and how it can affect Latinx students, and so much more. Latinas starts now. the show that's all about nuestras mujeres in the Latinx community. I'm Tina Beth Pina. It's currently Hispanic Heritage Month, and although we celebrate Latinas all year long, sometimes our families aren't as celebratory and can be rather blunt when it comes to our appearances. Estás muy flaca, or wow, estás gordita. Our culture never seems to be happy with what we look like, unless we're perfect. But what's perfect for you may not be perfect for someone else. So how do we encourage nuestras mujeres to be body positive? Here are two Latinas who shared with us how they do it. I didn't love myself for so many years and I'm taking control over my life. And I want especially Latinas to know that this is your life and you have control over it. Designer Ashley Nell Tipton won Project Runway back in 2015 and signed a contract with retail giant J.C. Penney to design and be the face of their plus-size boutique. One would have thought she had it all, but Ashley wasn't entirely happy. Finally had everything, but I felt deep down inside, I felt empty, I felt numb, I felt depressed, I felt sad, I felt alone. I felt all these emotions and I didn't understand how to fix it, but it all came down to my mental health and my health in general, my physical health, and where I decided that I really wanted to change these habits that I've created in my life. So what did you do? I decided to go to therapy and be work on those feelings that I was having in these thoughts about myself and how do I become healthy. Ashley got a personal trainer, had gastric bypass surgery to help with previously undiagnosed metabolic issues, and even took a small break from designing. Once I let go of, of those things that I allowed my head to consume of 24 seven, I had so much more space in my mind to consume of other things like creating. Just this past year, the Mexican-American fashionista started her own self-love program on YouTube called The Love You Show. The Love You Show is all about the fundamentals of self-love, self-care, and self-acceptance. We I'm live in this world of social media and it all ties into identity and who we are. And everybody is so fixated about how they present themselves. So that we decided to film this show and talk about these steps and help people love themselves. And I never thought that what I did or what I cared about or what I was passionate about would be so important to others until I heard how inspiring I was to people. One of those people is travel entrepreneur Alma Lopez Tillman. Actually inspired me because you know, she doesn't give a hoot. She goes ahead and forges with what she needs to do. And she's successful at it too, which is even more inspiring. I'm sure when I was her age, I probably didn't even know what I, where I wanted to be, what I wanted to do, but she's, she's focused. Alma is just as focused. The Mexicana is the founder and CEO of Alma Explores, which looks to inspire women of color to travel regardless of their body type. Being a plus size woman, you feel like, you know, you can't do certain things because maybe you don't want to be in a bathing suit because you're at the beach or, you know, none of that stuff, like at the end of the day should matter. Like you should just really worry about yourself and don't let what you look like uh, impede like where you want to go or what you want to do. A couple of years ago, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I also just took scuba diving lessons last week, which is something that I had always wanted to do. You shouldn't let your body size dictate whether you're going to go on a trip or you're going to go on a hike because uh, you know you feel a certain way. So when did you stop feeling a certain way? 
Well, I've always struggled with weight. I mean, I've always struggled. I mean, I feel like everybody has a, they say everybody has a struggle we don't know about, but it's hard when your struggle is food because everybody knows about it. You're wearing your struggle on the outside. So you're always afraid of being judged. I've come to a point in my life now where I am definitely better about my choices and I'm active and I am diabetic type two, which has to do with lifestyle, but one of the things that I noticed is when I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, I was training for it for like a year. And in the process of training, my sugar literally like dropped to almost zero diabetes. So I feel like travel has really helped me like keeping active and doing these things while I'm traveling. I think the key is his activity. So whether it's traveling and being active or designing while loving yourself, these Latinas are blazing an inspirational path of self-esteem for other Latinas to follow. I feel like as I've gotten older, I definitely have, you know, started to feel more comfortable with the person that I am and the person that I want to be. And I'm slowly but surely getting to a point where I really do not care about what other people think besides my mother and my husband. And that's it. As COVID-19 continues to ravage the nation with variants, many Americans remain skeptical about getting vaccinated or even of the virus itself. Latinas are about to discuss the impact COVID has had on their lives, including who they lost the virus, their feelings of guilt, and whether or not to seek professional help for those feelings. That's the topic of today's Caliente Caliente. In the beginning, I did feel very guilty and I, I felt um, at fault sometimes uh, because I was the first one who came positive with COVID at my house that we knew of. I didn't want to go in, but my mom's like, no, come inside. My father's like, no, come inside. We're going to eat dinner. I was like, no, I don't want to be here. I shouldn't be here. I'm just picking up my daughter. I'm going to stay home. And then after they, you know, they all got admitted, I was, I was very guilty. I, I said, what if I had not gone, you know, would they still be here? One of my angst was when people would come up to me and say, oh, so who, who had COVID first? Uh, my, I just said, my father just died and you want to know who got him sick. He could have gotten sick anywhere. It was everywhere, COVID. Right. And it still is to some extent, right? It's, yeah. it's creeping up again. My guilt was, did we do enough for him? And after my father passed away, I started dreaming about him constantly, constantly. I mean, this was vivid dreams. And one of the things he always said to me was, tu hiciste todo lo posible. Wow. You did everything that you could. Yo estoy bien. He will end it. You did everything you could, and I am fine. I got lucky. My daughter, you know, she didn't lose oxygen. All she did was have high fevers. I have to say I'm not at that same level of anxiety as I was in March of 2020. But, yeah, I don't sleep well. You know, I am not myself. I'm depressed. You know, I know I am. I haven't sought help, but I know I'm depressed. I'm scared. I'm anxious. I need counseling. I need professional help because, again, I feel like COVID's not going anywhere. I went to therapy. I did do it. And since I suffer from migraines, I had medication for migraines. They piggyback and on antidepressant onto it. And I will be going back to therapy a little bit. I as well. I'm so sorry to you cut have you off. To. I as well. Um, you know, I, after the fact, seek um, therapy because we didn't know how to grieve. It's also very taboo in our culture, but I did. Uh, it's been helping me. I am always very emotional when I talk about it, but it's been a rough year. COVID has destroyed people and families and our health because even if we didn't get COVID, it has affected our emotions. So on Facebook, there's a lot of uh, support groups for COVID-19. When we see people talking about COVID as if it's a joke, it's a slap in our face, right? Yes. And then we can't properly mourn because every day there's someone saying something that that's not factual and that's hurtful. I don't understand why people won't get vaccinated. If my father knew he could wear a mask, if he was supposed to wear a mask, he would have worn it. But back in March and early April, they said not to. That's one thing. If my father was alive and could get vaccinated, he would have gotten vaccinated. He would have still been vaccinated. Right? 
That's why you, I mean, yes, I feel yes. like I owe that much to my family, you know, who I lost. I was very skeptical in the beginning about the vaccine. I'm not going to lie. However, I work in the medical field. I know that I saw providers um, get their vaccines and I knew that I was doing the right thing. I don't want to lose my mother. I don't want to lose any more um, family members. I don't want anybody else to lose. So if I can help by getting a vaccine, I will. I have a hard time telling people to get the vaccine because I'm a member of the press, but I will say this, look at all the information out there that says it's saving people's lives. Look yes. at all the people who are dying now from COVID. Most of them, the majority of them are unvaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated. Everyone in my immediate household, my parents and my two girls. I convinced my sisters to get vaccinated. I asked them you know, be more afraid of what would happen if you're not vaccinated. These three Latinas in lab coats are on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic. Monica Mann, Elizabeth Zelaya, and Connie Massa are part of a team of scientists and medical technologists who analyze COVID-19 samples every day to track the spread of the virus and its mutations. The self-appointed Three Musketeers, or Tres Moscateras, are today's badass Latinas. Fashion Week is here and taking place all around the world. Cuban model and actress and influencer Rachel Bayori is one of those Latinas you'll be seeing on the runways and in magazines. And we got a chance to meet her. Let's take a look. I started when I was 15 years old in Havana, Cuba. The way that we model there is completely different because you don't really have a business-based modeling career over there. It's more about art with art pieces from designers, things that you really wouldn't wear. But then when I moved to America, it was a completely different story. Everything you wear, you can buy it. And I really enjoyed that because I could understand the difference between being a model in Cuba and being a model in America and the business behind modeling. I am Cuban, I am Latina, I can't deny that. Especially when I open my mouth and my hands, I'm always talking like this for some reason. So definitely there's like a stereotype thing happening in America. And that is something that you notice more when you are an actor, because you have to fit a stereotype for a certain movie or certain TV show. So you have to fit for that role. <laughs> It was super difficult when I was living in LA because a lot of auditions, they wanted the typical Latina with dark skin, darker hair, darker eyes that speak perfectly English, non-accent, just American English, second generation to fit that role of the dreamers or the people who were born here but didn't have um, legal papers or people who are second generation. Of course, I do have the fear that I have to look for another kind of job and I do have to create a different business. So when that kind of dies out, I have to start you know, making money in different ways. And I think that's something that I can see that a lot with social media that I'm focusing now on to that path for myself because I believe that as me Rachel I do have my opinion so I, I want to encourage people to know that there's not an end to any career. Yes. <laughs> I believe that the dream is just um, I'm living in now because I'm kind of like working in acting projects and then working as a model as well and as an influencer and I'm trying to do everything but in a way where I don't have to wait for a moment to arrive to be happy. I want to be my moment and make the moment happen. I don't want, I don't feel like the goal should be when I get there I'm gonna be happy. It should be like while I'm doing this I am making it happening so I am happy now it's never ending goal you know it's never the goal like I make it and that's it the biggest advice I have for the young models is like to take your career as a business and to be with people that really support you and love you specifically your agents because those are the ones who are gonna push your career are gonna make you make money and they're gonna make money so that's one of the biggest advice from me coming from Cuba and not knowing anything to now knowing way more than before. Latinas in CUNY TV celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. 
From September 15th to October 15th, Latinx everywhere come together to celebrate the customs, traditions, histories, and cultures that make up our heritage. The celebration originated in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week and was expanded to 30 days by President Ronald Reagan in 1988. The celebration pays tribute to the generations of Hispanic Americans who have positively influenced and enriched our nation. If you're wondering why it starts and ends in the middle of the month, that's because the 15th marks the Independence Day of five Latin American countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Mexico and Chile follow shortly thereafter on the 16th and 18th. Wepa. Critical race theory, or CRT, has become the buzzword in American politics. The lawmakers in nearly half the U.S. have proposed bills to limit it or have passed laws against it. But how many people truly understand what CRT exactly is? Correspondent Elena Romero is about to let us know. Critical race theory is racist. I don't see critical theory, race theory, in our Declaration of Independence. Critical race theory, or CRT, has become a political catch-all phrase for all things race and history-related. Experts say the term has been misused and misunderstood. Right now, um, there seems to be, uh, from my vantage point, a real convergence of interests around several conservative groups um, and, you know, this divisive cultural rhetoric um, that was perpetuated by the Trump administration and by other political figures that have really seen this sort of idea of critical race theory as a really great scapegoat for a lot of anxiety uh, about society and about culture. Dr. Limaris Caraballo teaches at Teachers College, Columbia University and at the CUNY Graduate Center. She explains exactly what CRT is. Critical race theory helps us to understand um, the way that a lot of policies in education and educational systems are informed by um, systemic racism. So it's really very helpful um, as an analytical lens uh, in understanding educational issues and in helping to identify where we should be directing our attention and where the reforms might need, um, might need to be focused. Critical race theory can be traced to the 1970s in the writings of legal scholars. Most recently, CRT has exploded in discussions around the K-12 curriculum. Legislation has been proposed in 28 states to restrict teaching around racism and bias, while five states have passed laws banning CRT, including Idaho, Iowa, Oklahoma, Texas, and Tennessee. When you put it into the law, what you're doing is you're putting the law back to a point where the law said it was separate but equal. And we don't want to go back to that separate but equal. What critical race theory in the law means is you're taking away these facts that happened, this history that happened, and you want to act as if everything is the same. Anti-CRT critics say CRT is a divisive ideology that indoctrinates people of color to hate whites in order to achieve equity. However, CRT advocates say that's a lie and claim CRT is being used as a political weapon against multicultural curriculum, ethnic studies, and anti-bias trainings. It is none of the things that are widely publicized right now as problematic the ban on critical race theory is vindictive, it is unnecessary, it limits academic freedom, and that is actually dangerous for everybody. Education and legal experts encourage Latinx parents to learn more about CRT while advocating for educational reform. We need to make sure that when we're talking about education that the students are able to engage in discourse. You want them to have a pedagogical experience that lets them do their own research. It's a completely manufactured crisis. 
um, that is deflecting attention from where it really needs to be. It distracts them from what they should be focusing on, which is how are their children learning? What are they learning? What is the curriculum? Who is composing, creating, and implementing that curriculum and how it's being done? For Latinas, I'm Elena Romero. Kids are returning to school this month, and Somos Community Care, a network of minority physicians, has partnered with Marvel's Avengers to urge back-to-school vaccinations for kids 12 and older nationwide. You know, I would say to parents, in the same way that you would vaccinate your children against measles, you need to vaccinate your children against COVID. The pop-up vaccination site will be in Times Square throughout Hispanic Heritage Month. Last season, we taught you how to be the jefa of your money. Now, financial advisor Maria Angeles Bonain is back to give you some tips so that your kids can also be the jefes of their money. You are the jefa of your money. Now, let's teach our children the meaning of money, understanding money, being responsible about money, and managing their money. And where do we start? We can help our children create a budget. That budget will allow them to plan what they'd like to do with their money. And for that, we need to look at the money coming in, the money that's going out, money coming in. For your children, this could mean gifts, grandparents. It could mean allowances, the money that you give every, week, every month, every week. It could mean earnings, like babysitting job or tutoring. Money going out could be divided into needs, those are the essentials, wants, those are the nice to have, and savings. I think it's incredibly important that we teach our children to save early on. And here's a tip. Remember the 50, 30, 20 rule. Of the money coming in, allocate 50% to needs, 30% to wants, and 20% for savings. I hope these tips are useful and see you next month. It's back to school time and research shows that girls aren't always into STEM in the classroom. In fact, only 20% of people in STEM are women and Latinas are even less represented in the science, technology, engineering, and math workforce. So a young woman from Oakland, California has taken it upon herself to even the STEM playing field. And that's why Julia Palacio says today is Latina on the rise. I love the sprites that you made and the sprites that you added. Um, could you show me some of the code that you made? Oh, nice, nice. This is in class as usual for these young girls in California. This is a free after-school STEM class that Julia Palacios is teaching, and this little girl is voluntarily taking to learn how to code. It's called Computing Minds. Computing Minds is a nonprofit, 501c3 nonprofit organization, and I created it to do something about the lack of female representation in the technology industry today. And I created it when I got to my first year of high school, so I was 14, and I started this organization because I wanted to get girls at a young age to see if they were interested in computer science and just give them a really fun first experience with it. Juliet, who's currently a senior in high school, offers the free online classes to girls and boys between nine to 12 years old who are interested in STEM. There's a hippo with more code and there's really a lot that you can add to this project. We mostly have had girls in all of our classes, but I mean, I definitely care about inclusion and making anyone feel comfortable. So there have been boys in the past who have joined. We definitely don't want to be excluding anyone. And our classes are totally free. So it's super important that they're as accessible as possible. And we use Zoom for the instruction and then we use Scratch and it's uh, this visual block-based language. It's super great for them to learn on because since it's so visual, they see everything that they're making. Computing Minds also offers college scholarships and an annual conference to bring like-minded kids together. It's really important to be able to talk to, you know, other females who are pursuing this because it can feel at times isolating to be the only female in a group of males. 
usually the stereotypical person who is interested in computer science is you know maybe a white male and i'm you know latina mexican female and i am also interested in it so that's why it's important for me to teach these girls have this conference this scholarship because it's so important to see others around you and try to support each other Although Juliet is already looking at colleges and getting ready to study STEM, business, and perhaps philosophy, she'll continue to work on computing minds in hopes it'll eventually be made available to everyone, everywhere. Our students are primarily in California, but I definitely want to reach out to students in different states or even different countries would be super amazing. Oh my gosh, nice. And I love what you did there with that little ombre effect. Thank That's you. That's super cool. And that's our show for today. For more information on what you just saw, check out our website at tv.cuny.edu and follow our social media profiles. We love sharing our Latina stories with you. And please make sure you tune in next time where we'll sit down with Sonia Manzano, who portrayed Maria on Sesame Street and is now the creator of the latest Latina animated show on PBS Almost Way. That and so much more next time on Latinas. Hasta la próxima. Bye-bye.